we're late getting here because we have an issue with the governor over a different bill that has nothing to do with uh, transitional residents. But I thank you all for joining us this morning. Um, and uh, I'm also going to be in another meeting, which is the budget conference committee at the same time I'm in this meeting. But we do have to end this meeting um, on the transition residences at 930 to take up H S H one forty five bill dealing with um, use of force. So with that, I'm going to ask um, to try to keep everybody to about 10 minutes if possible. So I'm going to start with Will Hunter um, since he watched the presentation um, and that would give uh, Jim Baker or Derek or Emily an opportunity to respond to that. <clears throat> His concerns. Will's so Will, uh, Will is a former state senator from Windsor County, um, and uh, currently is active in um, working with prisoners. Can you hear me? I can hear you fine. Yes. I hope you're not driving. Okay, great. No, I'm not. I'm, I'm sitting at my office, which is the Springfield McDonald's. Oh, um, okay. <laughs> Anyway, I, I, I really appreciate the chance to share these thoughts with you and uh, uh, just want to give you a quick little background. In 2013, I started a nonprofit organization called the Community Restoration Corps, and I now house people in five different communities, including approximately 47 former inmates, of which about 20 are currently under DOC or federal supervision. Several more are under strict conditions of release, having been released once they were able to provide a residence to the court. Most of the former inmates who I house have diagnosed mental health conditions, including many with substance use disorder. Most of the former inmates are on methadone or suboxone maintenance. Some are connected to the designated mental health agency, many are not. Uh, I've had a long time interest in criminal justice and housing during my time in the House and the Senate in the 70s and 80s. Corrections wasn't as big an issue as it is now. Uh, I practiced law in the 80s and 90s, and I started volunteering at Dismas House about 20 years ago. In 2006, I had an experience that was pretty important in my decision to get into this, which was picking up a former client as he got out of prison and trying to find him a place to live. He had a sexual conviction. His release had been on the front page of the paper. It was a horrible day. And I thought about the fact that this day he'd been looking forward to was, in his words, the worst day of his life. So I've gotten involved in doing a lot of housing. Uh, and as I said, right now, uh, house the people I've mentioned. In spring of 2013, I opened the first sober house of mine in Springfield. It's grown since then. I work very closely with the probation parole office in Springfield. Uh, and I house a lot of people who have gotten to the end of their time in transitional housing. Uh, many people who are getting out of jail with no place to go. Uh, I think that it's safe to say that both the Springfield and the Hartford office have turned to me with some very difficult cases. Um, and I have done my best to find a place for them to go. In the current uh, RFP, I think the DOC identified some important issues with the problem, with the way the system is being run now, including the importance of getting people into permanent housing, need to respect their dignity, the desire to have former inmates take responsibility and not just be told to do what to do all the time. But I think that the move to scattered site apartments and the loss of 90 congregate housing beds is a real step backwards. Um, I have vivid memories of the FSU apartments of the 1990s, and I'm sure corrections would say it'll be different this time. But I think that putting people when they first get out of jail in an apartment by themselves is a very hazardous. Uh, these are vulnerable people who have not, unfortunately, while they've been locked up, been taught 
things about making good choices and good decisions. As uh, corrections acknowledges, the decisions get made for them. Uh, but putting them out on their own, I think, has all kinds of hazards. Uh, I'm a strong believer in the value of congregate settings for multiple reasons. And they all have to do with combining support and accountability, which I think are essential to have go hand in hand. There's a world of difference between dropping somebody off in a one bedroom apartment, maybe giving them some business cards of the community partners who are gonna be in touch with them, and as an alternative, showing that person a bedroom in a welcoming house where there are other people who are gonna be around all the time. One of the questions I want you all to think about is who comes by to welcome the person back their first night in the community when they're in an apartment by themselves? I know who comes by and it's not the chief of police and the mm -hmm. chairman of the select superintendent of schools. It's the people who they got in trouble with back when they were out the last time. And I spend a lot of my time shooing people away who are coming by the houses that I run because they're not there to do Bible study. They're there to try to drag people back down. And I'm sorry, but that's the reality. Who keeps an eye on the former inmate to be sure that he or she is doing what he needs to be doing. Again, you can have a staff person who drops by once a day, once a week, a few times a week, but people are good at projecting an aura of competence. They're, they're, they've learned, especially people who've had histories of addiction, they've learned what to say to get through the conversation that they've got to get through right then. And it doesn't work very well. Um, who is there when you're in a scattered site apartment as a safety net when the therapist you were supposed to be having the telemedicine conference with wasn't there that day or didn't ever call? Uh, it's all well and good to talk about community partners and connecting people with services in the community, but those sometimes look better on paper than in reality. And finally, I'm going to say, and I'm going to be blunt about this. Scattered sites may reduce reincarceration because people don't get caught, but that's not fair to the people or to the community. We're facing unprecedented challenges right now. The mental health system, as you all know better than I do, is in very bad shape, especially after COVID. Telemedicine may sound nice, but it doesn't do what in-person service does. The opioid epidemic is raging. Overdose deaths are way up despite the omnipresence of Narcan and the fact that it's never been easier to get help. This is not the time to change the approach from congregate housing to a scattered site one and eliminate 90 congregate beds. I can talk for hours, but I'm respectful of your time and uh, that's the essence of what I want to get across. Thank you, Will. Um, I really appreciate your comments and frankly, having worked in a facility that was congregate living for youth offenders. I agree with you. Um, I'm disappointed. To the, and I, I'm not just talking about the Department of Corrections now the entire move away from congregate housing by DCF, by DOC and other groups. Um, it, it doesn't, it, it's in a, we, uh, I won't go there, but I appreciate your comments. And uh, I think all of us are concerned about what happens. I can remember the FSU apartments because there was one next to 204 Depot in Bennington when I worked there. And I would frequently see um, FS, uh, FSU officers um, struggling with um, offenders who were in those apartments, in that apartment, um, I should say, not in those apartments. And they were scattered and it was difficult. So, um, but um, I have to, uh, we don't really have the right to say that DLC, no, you can't do this. This is kind of um, 
the decision that they make. And I suppose we can hold up the money and et cetera. But our best effort is to make sure that um, I, I worry that by moving away from the congregate housing that we have in the state, that we lose the ability uh, to resurrect them because um, they'll be gone. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to Commissioner Baker at this point. Uh, his, uh, yeah, you're muted, Jim. Which I say, they're going to put that on my tombstone. Yeah, you're exactly. muted, Senator. It's not a good day when you, the, the first appearance you make, you start talking, you're muted, because that's going to set the tone for the rest of the day. <clears throat> for the record, my name is Jim Baker. I'm the Interim Commissioner of Corrections. And uh, I appreciate an opportunity to uh, talk about this issue. The first thing I got to say, Senator, and I, I, don't, I don't want this tone to set off wrong, but this is not the 1990s and it's not the FSU houses of the 1990s. I appreciate Senator Hunter's comments. Uh, I understand exactly where he's coming from, but to, to equate what the FSU houses, because you know, I, I remember it well, you know, I, I was the trooper responding to those places. Um, that was, and we all have to be, you know, we have to re remember the history here. The FSU houses in the 90s were nothing more than overflow locations because of the crowding in the jails. And there wasn't the programming that was built into this RFP that went out uh, in this situation. And, and the next thing I have to respond to is that I, I, appreciate, um, I appreciate the uncertainty of moving to scattered housing. But we're following exactly what CSG recommended in, in justice reinvestment. Our criticism has been about technical violations um, and re returning people to jail. And when taking a look at the CSG report, what it showed was the technical violations the majority of the time were around the loss of housing. And the loss of housing went back to many times the reusing of a substance. And they would lose housing as a result of that, because most of the of the congregate housing in the state has a sober housing model to it. And we took we took it, you know, when I first started a year ago, we took a great deal of criticism for for those returns on technical violations. So based on that, I challenged this early on in this when I didn't even fully understand the housing issue. I challenged the staff to take a look at new ways of approaching housing. And we're trying to get away from the term transitional. We know from the research and the data, which is very clear, not, not emotion, research and data is very clear, that congregate housing folks have less success transitioning to permanent housing. We know that. We knew that from the result of doing the theory of change that we did over the summer uh, of 2020. That was the basis for us putting the RFP out. And so what we're trying to do is answer the challenge that was given to us by CSG in their report, taking a look at different housing models in order for us to figure out if we can be more successful and not return people for technical violations. And so that's how we got to where we are. And the RFPs that went out were pretty clear. The other thing I'll take okay. to, to Senator Hunter, Senator Sears is that um, we're not just dumping people off at an apartment. The RFP is pretty clear that the folks that have bidded for and we have awarded contracts to have to put wraparound services around those individuals. And um, I know already that one of the providers is looking at employing 40 people across the state to provide those wraparound services. And this is where the whole system is going to have to come involved to include the CJCs uh, in wraparound. And, um, you know, I, I appreciate uh, Senator Hunter's comments about the police chief, but let me take back myself when I was the police chief in Rutland. I did greet people coming back to the community as the police chief. And that's the model we need to get to. The community, this is not just a corrections issue. This is a community issue. And uh, the model that we put in place is meant to follow the science and the data and the recommendations from CSG on taking a look at different housing models. Now we haven't walked completely away from congregate housing. 
there, there is still car and housing mixed in. And um, we're not walking completely away from it. But in order to balance our portfolio with the money we have, which is about $6 million, 2.1, which is 11, 15 Medicaid funds, uh, we've been able to do some things we haven't been able to do in the past which is create other opportunities for housing across the state and locations where we haven't had housing before by going to the scattered model. And I'll point out Orange County, Lamoille, Lamoille County is two locations where we haven't had housing in the past, which we're now gonna have housing. In order to get individuals closer to their support systems. And yes, I agree that um, there are certain elements of what we know in corrections that make people successful. One of them is permanent housing. Another one is, uh, is support, positive support, pro-social support, support. And yes, there is the danger of going back to um, wh where, you, where you came from before being incarcerated, that you're gonna end up with a population that's gonna have a bad influence on you. So I'm, I'm more than happy to go into the entire process we followed uh, to include the RFP, the scoring process. Um, my staff spent, 14 hours total reviewing these RFPs. We didn't make rash decisions about where we're going. We're following the science and we're following the data. We're following the recommendations from CFG. If, if there are suggestions that we should be doing something else, then I, I'm all ears. But when I first got here, justice reinvestment was a focus. And we took that advice from justice reinvestment, created a theory of change, <laughs> created an RFP, put that RFP on the street, and then spent 14 hours reviewing those to determine if folks were going to be the best fit for what that RFP was. And that's how we got to where we are. And I'm certainly willing to listen to other suggestions, but I do think, I, I do think if, we're gonna, if we're gonna follow Justice Reinvestment too, then we gotta follow Justice Reinvestment. <laughs> I, I appreciate that that was part of justice for investment too. I, I truly do as a member of that committee and as active in it. And as a member of the CSG board, I completely understand that. I think there is something to be I, I am concerned about the the availability in the community of the supports that are needed, particularly what I see in a mental health system. I, my local mental health agency will tell you that they're down four clinicians because they can't compete with the private sector for clinicians. So I, you know, if we're relying on that group, for example, to provide supports, um, and I'm not sure what the wraparound means, Jim. Um, well, what it means, Senator, is part of the RFP, the folks that are bidding for it are going to have to provide those services. And so we're, will, will we in some cases try to depend on the designated agencies? Absolutely. A part of the RFP was um, you, if you're going to provide the service, then you've got to provide that support as part of that service. And that's, that's what was built into the RFP that I think. So the, the RFP requires a clinician to be hired to work with the folks. I mean, is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, let, How do they provide the wrap? I, I'm not clear. It's not clear to me. I know what wraparound is for right. um, young foster children, for example. Senator, if it's okay. Yes, yes. Some of the providers definitely not clinicians. Something is causing a huge backlash. I'm going to um, let Emily answer that question, Senator. Ep I think Emily, she may do you have a second device on? No. I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm sorry. I'm, sorry, I'm, I'm not sure what's happening with my son. I think you, I I, Emily, Emily, I think you do have gonna, two devices going. Um, unfortunately. Yeah. I'm going to try and remove the one. Hopefully, that's not going to mess you up. Is that okay? Okay, let me see. Uh, um, I think, yeah, I think you removed it. Can we try it again, Emily? Good morning. I'm Good Emily morning. Higgins. That's much better. <laughs> I'm Emily Higgins, <coughs> for the record, the Corrections Housing Administrator. And I just wanted to chime in and say 
Yes, some of these contracts do have clinicians on staff or on contract as part of their funding agreement with us, and others have direct relationships with community providers who will be providing that support. And all of them have staff who will be providing one-on-one -on -one support to everybody who is housed and making sure they're doing the service coordination needed for whatever their needs are in terms of mental health, substance use, job readiness, you know, tenancy education, et cetera, et cetera. Derek, I know you presented a full PowerPoint presentation to the House Corrections and Institutions Committee, and I, I'm not asking that for that here, but perhaps as part of our, um, you could post that so people can look at that PowerPoint. You may want to refer to it in terms of what the plan is. But it is on our website as well. If yeah, if, if we could have Peggy post it on our website, it might be. Right. It, it is right. I, I think for both of you, the question is, um, how does what uh, former Senator Hunter was explaining, how, how do we avoid that type of situation that he envisions with this new plan? Well, um, as the commissioner said- Not we that do... congregate living is always perfect, by the way. I'm not suggesting that it is. There are, there are failures there too. So we do have a mix, as the commissioner said, still of congregate living environments as well as um, scattered site apartments. And the scattered site apartments have an entire team of staff who are checking in on those folks every day, who have a daily meeting between themselves to discuss what people's needs are and what the agenda is for the day and how they're gonna support them. Um, working <clears throat> closely with the probation and parole office locally with any community providers. So it's, it's really the housing first model is, is a very intensively supported model, it's, it's just that people are in their own apartment and people come to them instead of them having to go to a bunch of different providers. What about the relationship with the landlord? Well, in the case of most of these arrangements, the community partner has a master lease agreement with the landlord, so they provide a layer of protection, um, both for the tenant that they're renting to, sub subleasing to, or, or housing in that apartment. And um, they protect the landlord by being the leaseholder so that they can intervene if there are issues that arise. Okay. Thank you. I, I've got a, Senator Baruth, can you take over for a few minutes? And sure. I appreciate all of your testimony. I'm sorry, I miss, we'll miss Jim Henry's testimony, but since Jim and I talked about this already, I, I kind of know what he might say, and I appreciate the work that they've done down in uh, Bennington um, at the, is it now 208 Depot and other facilities? Yes, 208 Depot. Yeah, I get confused on my Depot streets. <laughs> Thank you. I'll, I'll be watching, but not. Okay. Um, so picking up midstream, um, Emily, uh, since we were with you, did you have more you wanted to offer in? Unless there are specific additional questions, I, I think I'm. Okay. Um, uh, Jim Henry, uh, how about you? I good morning. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Jim Henry, uh, Executive Director of CL Inc. Um, one of the programs under the CL umbrella is the 208 Transitional Housing Program. Um, uh, as we move forward with this, this process, um, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to participate in the new realm of the thought process with DOC. Um, and that's basically based on staffing. Um, we run a 24 hour seven 
staffing pattern, um, and we feel that makes our program and the individuals in our program successful. Um, so the cut that we have been presented with, um, unfortunately, is significant enough that we cannot survive that. Um, and I understand that. I understand business decisions. I understand in evolving with programs. We've done it for many years over at, uh, on the uh, DCF side that we are a part of. Um, so I do understand that. But unfortunately, we also have to make that business decision that we would not be able to survive that cut. So we will have to part ways. Um, it might be something down the road that we would be in, uh, you know, interested in. Um, I understand this is the initial phase, um, but maybe as, as things continue to evolve, you know, we'd be able to take a look at it you know, as, as we get down the road. Um, as we have evolved, you know, with other programs with DCF, I like to diversify um, in a sense. Um, so that may be something down the road, but unfortunately, the significant of the cut um, that has been presented to us is enough that we have to close that program. Is that the only uh, factor that prevents your participation is the, is the cut? Correct. Yes. Okay. Um, so if you don't have anything more, Mr. Henry, I'm wondering, um, Commissioner Baker, if you'd mind, if I went back to Will Hunter, um, Will, uh, I don't know if you'd be willing to, but having listened to the testimony, is there anything you'd like to offer back into the discussion? Sure. Um, I, two things. One is the what has happened in the 30 years that I've been involved with the criminal justice system in Vermont is that for some good reasons, people don't go back to jail as often as they used to. Um, I'm bothered by the use of the term technical violation. Uh, I think it makes it sound like we're talking about somebody who you know, didn't fill out a form right or something. But if we're talking about a recovering addict who relapses, uh, I don't think it's fair to anybody, including the community, to refer to that as a technical violation. That's a serious risk that is presented to the, the other people in the residence and to the community. And I agree that it's um, appropriate to think of alternatives to reincarcerating the person who uses and jeopardizes the recovery of the other people in the residence. Um, but going to a model of scattered sites, and I'm sorry to be so blunt, but the reality is you may have somebody checking in once a day and you can talk about wraparound services, but the reality may be different from the FSU apartments, but it is going to be a lot easier for risks to get bigger and bigger and bigger undetected when people are in scattered sites. Um, I also just want to say that it bothers me a little bit when we talk about the science of it as if human beings are like water molecules. You can do an experiment with water molecules and they're all the same. But human beings, as I remember the conversation we had in the committee room in the state house when I was on the Judiciary Committee and we were talking about sentencing guidelines and Judge Mahady came in and he talked about the fact that every defendant is like a snowflake, is unique. And I remember Chet Ketchum, a senator from Madison County, who said, yeah, and judges are like snowflakes too. And every one of them is unique. So maybe we need guidelines. But there is a limit to how much you can do a social science experiment and say, this works and this doesn't work. Um, I, I just think we should be careful about making what is a pretty tectonic shift of getting away from the congregate housing 
uh, getting rid of 90 beds, which is what I think is going to be happening. And it sounds like it'll be more than that because uh, of what Jim Henry has said about they're not going to be able to do the beds that they would be part of. So close to 100 beds in congregate settings are going to be gone. And there's a lot of institutional knowledge, there's experience, there's the relationships with the community partners that the current staff has that are going to be lost. And I think it's a, it's a serious risk. Um, again, the numbers, if we're motivated only by keeping people from going back to jail, this may work, but at a cost to the community. Um, already, the, the situation with the people in the local probation and parole offices is that they know that people should can't go back to jail as often as they used to go. And so there are some people who get pretty far down the path of their addiction and they're still in the community without meaningful intervention, uh, which is another issue. But I just think that it's important to keep in mind. Finally, I would just say this. I work very closely with the Springfield Probation and Parole Office, and I don't think that this was a bottom up change. Uh, there are many times when somebody from that office will talk to me about housing somebody, and I'll do the research and look into the person's situation and come back and say, you know, I really think that that person would probably be better off in the Phoenix House Rise program rather than in one of my places. And now the Phoenix House Rise program is gonna be gone. Um, so I, you know, I understand where DOC is coming from. I, I appreciate the motivation that all the speakers have, but I just think this is a, a serious shift and I don't think it's a good one. Uh, thank you, Senator White. So uh, this is just, maybe this isn't even an appropriate question, but I guess I have some concerns, some along the same line as um, Mr. Hunter, but my, I'm wondering if we're losing 90 beds um, and the thought is that they would be um, housed elsewhere, we have a vacancy rate in Brattleboro of 1%. We have people who have um, Section 8 vouchers who've been looking for housing for over a year. There are no apartments. So my question is, where, where will these people go? Because there aren't, there aren't apartments anywhere. I, Mr. I Baker? I can answer that, Senator Booth, if you would like. Absolutely. Um, first of all, Senator White, I appreciate um, your observation. Um, and, and then Senator Roof, it's okay. I'd just like to be able to clarify a couple of things that uh, Senator Hunter said. Please, so, please do. Um, because of what Emily described to you as the relationship, it's, it's not a direct relationship with the tenant. Um, for example, in Burlington, the Burlington Housing Authority is gonna be the go-between. They're securing, they're securing the housing. And so let's, let's, be, let's be really candid about landlords. And when someone shows up with a Section 8 voucher, um, let's be real candid about what happens with landlords, about picking and choosing who comes into um, housing. And that's one of the things that I, my point I was trying to make earlier about when I was the police chief in Rutland. This is a community effort. This is where we're gonna be leaning very heavily on the CJCs as part of this effort of getting people into permanent housing. And it kind of goes back to my point earlier, and uh, you know, uh, Senator Hunter brought this up. Um, we're not dealing we're not dealing with science or data from the 1990s or even the early 2000s. I mean, the research the research on trauma informed care is pretty clear now. It's pretty clear about what you need to do to make folks successful or help them be successful. I should say, not make them help them be successful as a result of the situation they find themselves in, in life as a result of being exposed to trauma. The research is light years ahead of where we were in the 90s and early 2000s. And we know that part of that 
is dignity and self-respect. And that's what we're trying to do with, with, with permanent housing. Um, you know, I just, when I hear transitional housing, this is what I picture. I picture a young lady leaving Chittenden who's been in jail and they've got two grocery bags or, or two garbage bags full of clothes and they go to a transitional housing and they're living out of garbage bags um, in a transitional housing setting. That for me is not dignity and self-respect. And so we, we know what the research tells us. We know what the latest research on trauma informed us. And the other thing is I, I appreciate and I do appreciate because I know that Senator Hunter does, does a lot of work with our staff in Springfield and Hartford. But on the committee that reviewed these were individuals that worked in the field. We had two individuals that sat on the committee. They're probation and parole officers and caseworkers on the ground. This was a bottom-up process. The change of theory was a bottom-up process. It wasn't a top-down process. If anybody knows me and knows my history, um, I, I, I often talk the best changes in the organization come from the bottom up. And that's what this process was. So um, I, I really appreciate um, people's frustration about us going in a different direction. But if we're going to follow the guidance from, from council of state governments, justice reinvestment too, then we got to stay loyal to what that research was. And that's what we're doing. Now, let me just talk, you know, and, and, and I haven't had a chance to talk directly to Jim Henry, but I, I do think there's room for us to have conversations. Um, if, if we get to understand what the financial situation is there, we have room to talk about that. But we got to get an understanding of your financial situation, Jim, to figure out where we can gap that. And I encourage you to work with Emily and, and Derek on that. Um, and I know that um, Commissioner uh, Brown is very interested and talking about potentially expanding um, the, the uh, youthful offender housing. So, um, I mean, I think there's options there to save your business um, model. Uh, if, if, if we can just sit down and talk about financials and figure out where your gap is, if we can help out. I mean, I have a lot of money. I have some, but between myself and Commissioner Brown, I think we can put something together that can can uh, recreate 208 for you. So, well, that's very hopeful. Those are my comments. Senator White. I just, I, I still am concerned about the, the um, lack of housing that actually exists. And I, I work in housing down here. Mm -hmm. And I've seen, I, I know that there, there is no, there is no vacancy in Brattleboro. So whether or not, um, the housing authority or the community justice center or whoever is working with, with you. I mean, I'm not saying we shouldn't do this. I, I am just, I am really concerned that there will not be um, the available apartments for people because I can't think of three apartments in Brattleboro right now that are for rent. I can't, I couldn't tell you. So, and I work in the housing field down here. I, I, I appreciate it, Senator. I'll say it again. I think uh, uh, I was just briefed this morning by Emily and Derek, and we're making progress already around the state security apartments. Because that About what? We're, we're already making progress around the state securing apartments. Um, it, you know, we're, we're already making progress securing apartments um, through people like the Burlington Housing Authority. I, and I appreciate you're on the ground. I know you're in that business. I understand that. Um, but I often said, you know, because of the housing lot, if you're if you're a landlord and you got a, a, a young couple that just had a child or a registered sex offender, who do you think you're renting the apartment to? That's why this model, the theory of change, puts someone in the middle of that in order for us to better manage it. And and we know that this is a risk. We understand that. Um, but we're already starting to secure apartments around the state um, as a result of this move. Okay. Can I, oh, go ahead, Senator Nitka. I just am wondering, you know, this is coming at a time when the state is making an, any, the state and a lot of private providers are making a tremendous effort to get placements for all the people who are in motels right now from COVID. And so I'm not wondering, I'm wondering how does all this kind of mesh with that huge 
force going on to find housing for those people as well. So how's that working? Derek, do you want to take that one? I'd be happy to address that. Um, my name is Derek Neodefnik. I use he, him pronouns. I'm the Community and Restorative Justice Executive with the Vermont Department of Corrections. Thank you for the opportunity to provide a little more context and detail for what is significantly a, uh, a shift. And I want to acknowledge that that shift ripples out in, in, in numerous ways and um, creates um, potential friction points with programs that many of us have come to know over, over the years. Um, to um, your question, um, Senator um, Nitka, um, in the RFP, um, one of the prominent characteristics against which programs were scored was clear evidence of the program being connected to the broader homelessness prevention infrastructure in that community, often referred to as the continuum of care. And that is, uh, as I imagine um, the committee is aware, uh, an intentional uh, coordinated set of uh, programs that all look at how folks can hopefully be prevented from being homeless. If they are homeless, get immediate services, be rapidly rehoused. And historically, for a couple of reasons, uh, one of them being that the HUD definition of, of um, homelessness does not extend to folks who are incarcerated. So it kind of puts um, DOC funded housing historically as sort of sat outside of the broader um, uh, professional community uh, devoted to homeless prevention. Um, Historically, there's been kind of no uh, intentional bridging there. What we looked at in this RFP process was show us that the program that you run has a seat at the table and is part of all of these other conversations that are managing that very issue you're talking about. So that if somebody is eligible for other HUD funded services, that we're not missing that opportunity. We're in fact ported into those structures and um, it was interesting and surprising to see in some cases that um, historically some of those applicants, and frankly, those were uh, some of the applicants that did not necessarily score well, um, had no pre existing connection to the continuum of care. So we elevated that as a criteria to address the specific dynamics that you're asking about. Does that make sense, Senator? Yes, it certainly makes some sense, um, but the bottom line is, where are the apartments or rooms or whatever? I guess that's the, I know, um, you know, uh, Neighborhood Works of Western Vermont did an enormous push on to find housing. They had, a, I think they had a, been assigned 100 homeless folks, and they were able to find housing, I think, for 84 of them, um, 84 or 64, I don't remember the number, but it was an enormous push to get those and they still haven't been able to get for everybody. So, I don't know. Yeah, this, uh, this is definitely part of the, um, the conditions that we're aware of and that we are going into. Um, it is our, um, our professional uh, belief that by partnering with Housing First agencies that bring uh, landlord relation management uh, the financial backstop that the state grant presents and, and we have also built into um, these grants what's called a landlord risk pool. So additional funds that really mitigate the risk from the landlord's perspective of excess uh, losses associated. So we're basically using uh, the relational capital that organizations can develop and the financial capital that the state's provided to make a value added proposition to landlords and, um, and experience what we expect to be a greater stability. I recognize that by walking away from those congregate beds um, that may at face value seem a little counterintuitive in a tight housing market. However, I just wanna take one step back and really uh, emphasize the fact that even though those beds are there, the data tells us that the 
uh, rate of unsuccessful program exits in those beds was not uh, an effective use of public dollars and not effective for those individuals. Uh, we saw a demonstrably higher rate of unsuccessful and unplanned program exits associated with the congregate programs. That put those, those individuals into a state of crisis and often to pre-JRI back uh, into prison. So those are outcomes that none of us want, despite the fact that yes, those beds are there. So yes, we are courting some risk, absolutely. But we are courting risk in response to the known suboptimal outcomes associated with our historical paradigm. And we're doing it in a way to try to lean into that risk but not fully, as the commissioner said, step away from those congregate beds um, and do that within the context of a balanced budget. Emily Higgins and then uh, Senator White. Sorry, I just wanted to expand a tiny bit on what Derek was, was saying in that we already have a number of existing partners statewide who provide scattered site apartments. So we're not starting from zero. I wanna be really clear so for example, in Brattleboro, we have Groundworks Collaborative who offers beds in their shelter as emergency housing. They have beds at a, several different projects around town, Great River Terrace, the chalet. They, they're partnering very closely with the affordable housing provider, Wyndham and, Winsome, Wyndham and Windsor Housing Trust to develop project-based opportunities that connect people directly with vouchers that result in permanent housing. Um, so yes, we are having to ramp up and increase the number of apartments that we have dedicated for those re-entering the community. However, we already do have a number of those in place. Um, so it's we're adding two or three apartments in a lot of places as opposed to starting from zero and adding 15. And the net total of, of apartments and, and beds that we'll be providing statewide is more than it was last year, more than it currently is. So I want us to be careful about saying we're losing 90 beds, we're, we're shifting capacity um, mm -hmm. in a different direction, but we're actually ending up with more opportunities and more local housing for people in their home communities. Senator White. So do I understand that you're doing this on a, on a, um, not all at once that you're, you're really, um, I guess my fear is for example, in, um, and I, I work for the housing authority in Brattleboro. So I, I do know about those partnerships and I know about the housing in Brattleboro, but, um, I guess my question is if you, for example, close down uh, Phoenix House right now in Brattleboro, and I don't know how many people are living there right now, that would, there aren't apartments right now for those people. And, and so if it's done on a gradual basis and people are, the beds are only shut down as you find apartments for people, that makes more sense to me than just closing the beds. Because I'm thinking, um, Commissioner Baker, you you said so. If you're a landlord and you have, you can rent to somebody coming out of prison, or you can rent to this nice young couple that just had a baby. Who would you rent to? And I I understand that having somebody in between there allows the landlord to. But what happens to the nice young couple with the baby? They have no apartment, and so my concern is that we need to do this, as Alice said on a gradual basis so that we aren't, there's still 16 people that Senator Nitka was talking about that are looking for houses. And I know we have people in Brattleboro looking for apartments. And I fear that if we just do this all at once, that we will, we will, um, uh, Anyway, uh, that that's a that's a, a real fear that I have. All right, I hear your concern. I hear your concern. I'm going to let Emily talk about the transitional period here in a minute. Okay. I hear, I hear your concern. And if I, I could just yeah, go ahead. If I could just throw in one thing, I think 
we may have to shift gears in a oh. few minutes, but um, but Sorry. Emily, when you when you answer, I'm wondering if you could um, respond to everybody from DOC has talked about there being a risk, and I think everyone's in agreement on that. What what is the plan uh, in the event that things don't go the way you are expecting? Um, I know that you never want to build a a plan B as you're building plan A because it calls into question plan A, but um, I'm remembering our experience closing down the state hospital. Um, Senator Benning and I were involved in trying to get more beds um, and we, we sort of lost that fight. It turned out later that we did need significantly more beds. Is there a, is there a thought in place about what to do if Senator White and Senator Nitka prove uh, correct in their worries? Sure, I can say that we're being very intentional about that. Um, so for example, with Phoenix House of New England, um, they still will have at least 25 beds in Vermont funded through ADAP. Uh, and we have met with their uh, Vermont manager with all of our local probation and parole offices who have Phoenix House sites. And we have talked specifically about transition planning for residents in those houses. Um, Phoenix House has stated explicitly that they would like to keep people there if possible and fund them with ADAP because they're, these clients are mutual clients in most cases. Um, so we are working intensively with every provider around making sure existing residents are not exited to homelessness, of course, and are exited to a stable apartment um, or transitioned in a different way. Um, so that's a huge part of the work that's ongoing. And we've been working on that for uh, at least a month, couple months in many cases, and we'll continue to do that through the transition. So that's our top priority. Thanks. Okay. Uh, well, thank you all. Is there any further questions from the committee? Um, seeing none, um, I'd like to thank you all for being here. I know Senator Sears is very concerned about this. Um, unfortunately, he had the conference committee for the budget at the same time. Um, Senator Sears, do you want to close out? Yeah, I'm just trying to close my other meeting. SSI treatment and still provide. You can hear Senator Kitchell, I'm sure. Do you, do you, yeah, I, I was not. Technology. Not my... in those While we're waiting, can I comment that, Will, you look a lot like Charlie. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'd I never noticed that too. before. No. Oh. All right. I, I would thank all of you. And I did uh, follow some of the conversation. I think actually it's been a helpful conversation to have. Appreciate the folks from Corrections and Will Hunter and Jim Henry for joining us this morning. Um, and I'm sorry I missed the last 20, 25 minutes. Um, I did try to keep track of both meetings. But um, anyway, thank such is life under Zoom. Thank you. Thanks, folks. Thank you very much. So let's transition.